Hi, this is Katie Peer. I'm part of the MSP430 customer applications team. Today we're going to be discussing designing with ultra low power segmented displays and MSP430. First, we'll quickly look at some end equipment that are enabled by MSP430 LCD. Then, we'll go through a simple overview of segmented LCD basic operation. Then we'll go through MSP430 specific LCD features. Finally, we'll look at the MSP430 LCD portfolio so that you can help decide which device is proper for your particular design. This slide shows a number of end applications that can be enabled with MSP430s with integrated LCD modules. These include remote controls, blood glucose meters, and any LCD application where battery power is important. Next, the next few slides are going to discuss the basic operation of segmented LCDs, how they work. This slide shows a simplified version of the structure of a segmented LCD display. Essentially, it consists of two polarizers rotated 90 degrees from each other. These polarize light coming into the display, and then there's a reflective backing, which will reflect light that gets through. In between the polarizer layers, there are liquid crystals with electrodes to apply a charge. If a segment is off or gray, there's no charge applied. In this normal state, the liquid crystals have a twisted structure that will turn the light 90 degrees. So light comes in through the first polarizer, coming out of the polarizer all in one direction. Then the crystals turn the light 90 degrees, which allows the light to pass through the second polarizer, which as we mentioned, is turned from the first. Then the light will reflect off the backing and does everything again in reverse, passing back out of the front of the display. This makes the segment look gray because most of the light is being reflected back out. If a segment is on, or black, there is a charge applied across the crystals in this segment. When a charge is applied, it causes the crystals to untwist. So this time, the light goes through the first polarizer, but the crystals do not twist it. They just let it go straight to the next polarizer. At that point, the light will all be blocked because it's it is still at the 90 degrees from the first polarizer, so it cannot go through the second polarizer. Because the light cannot get through, it doesn't make it to the reflected backing and is just absorbed, making the segment appear black. LCDs must be driven with AC signals. A DC level on an LCD segment will damage the LCD. The MSP430 LCD module generates the AC waveforms automatically. The RMS voltage presented to an LCD segment is what determines whether it is on or off. The example waveforms above show resulting waveforms of both an on and an off segment. The on segment has a much larger RMS voltage than the off segment. Note that both segments have waveforms that have net zero DC voltage, but the RMS voltage of the on segment is higher, which causes it to turn on. Next, we're going to discuss MSP430 specific LCD features. Muxing allows a much larger number of segments to be controlled by a limited number of pins. If you have an 8 mux LCD, for example, you will have 8 common or COM pins, and each SX or segment pin can drive 8 segments. So if you had an 8 MUX capable part with 8 COM lines and 40 segment pins, S0 through S39, then you could control 320 segments with only 8 plus 40, which makes 48 pins. Some MSP430s, like F67791, support up to 320 segment displays. However, you should see your device-specific data sheet to see how many segments your particular device supports as it will be limited by the number of LCD pins available on the device, in addition to the muxing capability of the LCD module in that device. Here is a basic 2-mux example. You can see that each segment is controlled by two signals on two pins in this case, a COM-X pin and an SX segment pin. 
you can see that the combination of the signal on the S0 and COM0 lines creates the resulting signal for the segment. While the resultant waveform has a net zero voltage, it has a higher RMS voltage that causes the segment to be on. You can see also that the combination of the signal on the S1 and COM1 lines creates the resulting signal for another segment. In this case, the RMS voltage is not high like the other one, so the segment is off. Don't worry if the waveforms look complex. Remember, these waveforms will all be generated automatically for you by the MSP430 LCD module. The VLCD voltage sets the voltage level of V1, or the highest LCD voltage level, if you recall the waveform on the previous slide. This voltage level can be set in software to be sourced from a VCC, the internal charge pump, or from an external source. Most MSP430 modules include a built-in charge pump. The original LCD module does not, but LCD A, B, and C all have one. The charge pump has programmable voltage levels for use with different segmented LCD displays. You can also reference the charge pump voltage off of an external source. This is useful if you want to use multiple MSP430s together to control a larger segmented display than you could control with a single device. There is an app note on TI.com on how to do this. The charge pump requires an external capacitor for operation. If you do not have this capacitor, and the charge pump is turned on, you could damage your device. Because of this, some of the newer LCD modules, like LCD-C, include detection circuitry that will automatically disable the charge pump if no cap is present, and set a flag to help warn you. The voltage V1 from the waveforms we saw earlier is generated by VLCD which, as we just learned, can be sourced either externally or from the internal charge pump. To produce the rest of the voltages in the waveforms, V2 through V5, you need to be able to produce the bias voltages at fractions of VLCD. This can also be generated either internally or externally, and it can be set entirely independent of how you've chosen VLCD to be sourced. Depending on the muxing and specific MSP430 device you are using, Different bias options like one half and one third are available. Generating the bias voltages internally is simpler because you do not have to provide any external resistor dividers. However, generating the bi bias voltages externally can be lower power. However, it requires you to provide external resistor divider circuitry. The resistors in the divider should all be the same as each other, but the size used will depend on your particular display that you are driving. When using the charge pump, the VLCD of the display is software controlled. This allows you to be able to easily adjust contrast in software. This will adjust your other LCD voltages as well, regardless of whether you use external or internal biasing. Your different biasing modes and the particular display that you use are also going to have an impact on your contrast ratio. As you can see in the chart, the contrast ratio can be represented as the RMS voltage for on and the RMS voltage for off, divided by each other. As you can see, you'll get better or worse contrast depending on the muxing and bias configuration that you're using with your display as this will affect the waveforms that are output. Some configurations trade off a reduced contrast ratio for a reduction of the full-scale LCD voltage VLCD used. You can also control contrast externally. Most MSP430 LCD modules include internal timing generation. The clock can be further scaled and divided within the module to achieve the desired frequency for FLCD. FLCD is the frequency that generates the timing for the common and segment signals. You can determine your required FLCD using the calculation at the bottom of this slide. FLCD equals 2 times MUX times F frame, where F frame is the frame frequency from the data sheet of the LCD that you are driving. Usually your LCD data sheet will have a range of allowed frame frequencies 
which gives you options when choosing the FLCD to use. The thing to keep in mind is that the lowest frequency will give you the lowest current consumption, but the highest frequency will give you the least flickering on the display. So typically, it is a trade-off between performance and current consumption that you need to weigh when trying different FLCD frequencies. The way that you indicate in your software which segments should be on or off is through the LCD memory registers. Each bit represents a single LCD segment connected to a common and segment pin pair. The row corresponds to the segment pin, and the columns, each bit within the row, correspond to the common pin. In 2MUX through 4MUX modes, the upper and lower nibbles of each row correspond to different segment SX pins. In 5MUX to 8MUX modes, there are more than four common pins, so the whole row must be used for each segment SX pin. The example at right shows the memory configuration in 2MUX to 4MUX mode. You can see that the 38 and 39 segment pins correspond to the lower and upper nibbles of the byte. And to control the segment connected to COM0 plus S38 and COM0 plus S39, you would have to set the highlighted bits high or low. Most MSP430 LCD modules support blinking. This can be either blinking individual segments or the entire screen, depending on the LCD module on your device and the muxing being used. The blink frequency is also configurable, but it must be less than the frame frequency. When using individual segment blinking, whether a segment blinks or not is controlled by the blink memory. The structure of blink memory is just like LCD memory. You can also use blink memory as a secondary display memory. The LCD display bit controls which memory is currently being used. You can also use one of the blinking modes to toggle automatically between displaying the two memories. Blinking features supported can vary between LCD modules and can depend on the MUX mode being used, so be sure to check your specific device datasheet and user's guide. Some MSP430 devices have just dedicated LCD pins. However, others have configurable pins muxed with digital I.O. functions. When you aren't using all of the LCD pins on these devices, you are then able to use the other pins for other functions by configuring them in software. Depending on the module, you can control the pin selection in groups of pins or down to the individual pin level. The MSP430 LCD modules are designed with ultra-low power in mind as a key focus. In addition to some of the low power options we discussed in earlier slides, like the adjustable charge pump voltage level and the options for external biasing, the charge pump is also only on for a small percentage of the time. It runs with a low duty cycle, so its peak current will only be seen for a very small portion of the overall time the LCD is on. This helps the LCD to keep a very low overall current. As you can see in the example on the right, this example is for LCD A. The charge pump has a peak current of 2 milliamps on this part, but it is only on for 425 microseconds. As this is a very small portion of the overall time, the average current comes out to only 2.3 microamps. And this is just an example for LCD A. There are other LCDs that have lower peak current. For example, the MSP430 F6736 device with LCD-C has a peak current of only 400 microamps, so its average current is even lower. See your device-specific datasheet for more details. Driving larger LCD, LCD uh, glasses can present its own set of difficulties. It is harder to keep good contrast on larger LCD glasses, and they consume more current because each segment is like a capacitor that's constantly being charged and discharged. The big, a bigger LCD with bigger segments has a bigger capacitance and more charge happening each cycle. There is an app note on the TI website on driving large LCDs with the LCD peripheral. This should prove helpful if you're using a large LCD glass. Please note, when we talk about large LCD glass, one of the things we're talking about is a large digit size, not just a large number of segments. The size of the digits is going to affect 
uh, the difficulty of driving it. The next couple of slides are going to discuss LCD layout and software considerations, namely how choosing a particular display and a particular layout can make your software easier to read and use. Choosing the right display and carefully choosing which MSP430 pins you want to connect to particular pins on the display can make a big difference in the ease of use of your code and its efficiency. This ties into how the display muxes different areas together onto the same seg pin in relation to what types of things you will be displaying on the display, like alphanumeric characters. It also relates to the way the MSP430 LCD memory is structured in different MUX modes. As you can see, on this 4MUX display, to be able to make all the digits 0 through 9, you only need to use two pins, as you can see them highlighted in red and blue on this slide. This is a nice feature of this particular display in that these segments are neatly grouped onto only two pins rather than one of the segments that make up the, the numerical character being on another pin. This is going to be one thing that helps simplify our code. Next, we will need to choose a set of LCD pins on the MSP430 to correspond to these two segment pins on the LCD. Remembering the memory layout of the LCD registers, you will remember that in 4MUX mode, which is what this display is, each segment pin corresponds to one nibble of the memory register. So the best option in this case is to put both of the LCD pins 1 and 2 that we need to create a digit on MSP430 LCD pins that share the same LCD memory register. This way we can do a single byte access to write the whole digit instead of having to handle doing two separate accesses where we'd have to be careful to not alter the other nibble of the register when we did a write. This slide shows displaying the digit 2 with a single memory access on the same display we were talking about before. There's also a few tips on how to make your software easier. To display the 2, on pin 2 we need these bits set, and on pin 1 we need these bits set. Now we have an 8-bit number that we need to write into LCD M5. This will display the 2 on the display. However, to make things easier, you can create a lookup table for yourself. Th this lookup table, for example, contains the digits 0 through 9 and the hex values that need to be written into the memory registers in order to display these digits. This makes the code much easier to read. You can also make use of pound defines so that you don't have to remember which LCD memory goes with which pins on the LCD display. You can even define a naming convention to match your LCD datasheet naming convention to make the code easier to read side by side with the LCD datasheet. In this case, this particular digit where we're displaying the 2 is called A1, and the successive digits across the display are A2, A3, etc. So we can make pound defines for the different LCD memory lines to match these digit names. Next, we will have a quick overview of the MSP430 LCD portfolio and mention a few devices that contain the different LCD modules. The first module we'll discuss is the original LCD module found on some F4XX devices. This module, of course, as all MSP430 LCD modules, is designed for low power and automatically generates all of the signals that you need. It supports up to 4MUX mode and a 160 segment display. The timing is derived from the basic timer module in the device. An example of a device family with the LCD module is the FW42X family. This has an integrated LCD driver that supports up to 96 segments. Some target applications for this device include gas meters, water meters, and home automation. The LCD-A module has a number of improvements over the original LCD module. You'll see that I have highlighted the differences in red, and this is what I will continue to do on the next few slides as we go through more modules. LCD-A adds the internal charge pump so that you can control contrast in software 
and also so you do not have to externally provide this voltage. It also supports internal or external biasing and half bias for three or four MUX modes. On this module, the timing is now generated internally instead of taking up your basic timer module that you may want to use for other functions. It also adds blinking capability, but only for the whole screen at once. An example of a device family with the LCDA module is MSP430 FG47X. This family includes an integrated LCDA driver with up to 128 segments. Some target applications for this device include electrocardiograms or pulse oximeters, though other applications are definitely also supported. The LCDB module is included on some MSP430 F6XX family devices. In addition to the features of LCDA, this module adds up to 184 segment display capability and individual segment blinking with a separate blink memory instead of having to blink the entire display together. An example of a device family with the LCDB module is the F665X family which can support up to 160 segment LCD using LCDB. Some target applications for this device include blood pressure monitors, ventilators and respirators, and other applications. One of the main features that people are often interested in on the 665X family is that it goes up to 512 kilobytes of flash or 64 kilobytes of RAM. The LCDC module is found on some other F6XX family devices. This module goes up to 8 MUX, allowing it to support a much larger display, up to 368 segments. It also adds in one-third bias mode for 5 to 8 MUX. The F677X is an example of a device family with the LCDC module, supporting up to 320 segments. This device family is primarily targeted at smart grid applications. In fact, you can find some TI designs on the TI designs website that use this device, including metering EVMs with LCDs on them. This slide shows our, all the features that we've just discussed all in one table. This should help you choose which LCD module may be needed for your particular application. So it is a good reference to keep in handy. Now, not all MSP430 modules contain, not all MSP430s contain LCD modules, but sometimes you still want to be able to drive an LCD display with them. This can be done a couple of ways. You can either interface to an external LCD controller, so an LCD glass with a built-in driver, using SPI or I2C, or you can use software to bit bang the signals out, but typically this is only with a very small display as the software is complex. There is an app note on bit banging the signals called Software Glass LCD Driver based on MSP430. This is available on TI.com and I've provided the link below. The methodology for this example achieves half bias by using resistor pairs and setting the pin as an input in order to get the VCC over 2 state. It uses a timer module within the device to do frame timing and there is example software included with the app note for Formux. This slide discusses some of the way that that app note works for bit banging the signals. Each frame is divided into eight time slots. You have to have four time slots, one for each com. And then each of these needs to be divided into two parts since we aren't going to be able to have a DC signal because LCDs have to have an AC signal. We must toggle somewhere in the frame. This is why we have to have eight time slots. The internal timer A module is used to generate the eight slots. Each time the timer interrupt fires, the device wakes, and in software decides all of the common seg lines state that needs to be set, depending on what time slot we're in. As you can see in this picture as we go through it, if the segment and COM signal in a particular time slot are the same as they are on this slot that's highlighted right now, then the resulting waveform has the segment off. 
However, if the segment and comm signal are opposite, then the segment is on because the combined waveform has a higher RMS current voltage. You can see that only three voltages are used, a full scale, the ground, and the VCC over 2 generated by setting the pin as an input. There are trade-offs to bit banging your LCD signals. The advantage is that you can have a small LCD controlled by a part that doesn't have an LCD module, so this gives you increased device options. However, there are several disadvantages versus using a device with an LCD module built in. There's higher current consumption because you must wait eight times in this example for each LCD frame and then pr process, make decisions, and output on the pins at every time you wake. Also, you're taking up CPU cycles just to keep the display on even with, if none of the segments are changing because you're still having to wake up every eight times to keep the pins toggling and keep the display on. If you were using a display with a built-in LCD module, this toggling, these waveforms, would be happening automatically from the module and you wouldn't have to wake up the part just to keep the LCD in the same state. There's also more external components needed and much, much more complex code. There are also some displays that have built-in LCD drivers. Usually these are dot matrix LCD or e-paper displays. These are typically controlled using SPI or I2C, so an MSP430 with the USI, USCI, or EUSCI module can easily control these types of displays. Please note that some displays do not have readback capability, so in order to know what's already on the display, you may need to store a copy of the current image in your MSP430 RAM or FRAM to keep track of what's on the display. An example of a dot matrix LCD controlled using a serial interface is the Sharp LCD Booster Pack available at TI.com. Next, I'm going to go through a couple of MSP430 segmented LCD EVMs and reference designs that you can find as an example. I've tried to select one for each MSP430 LCD module option. The first is the F4XX Experimenters Board. This features an MSP430 FG4618 device, which has an LCD-A module. The EVM has an 88-segment LCD that displays digits and a number of other sim symbols on it, and it uses Formux mode. This is a general-purpose EVM, so it has a variety of different interfaces to, to show off the different modules of this MSP430 device. These include a microphone, a buzzer, touch capability, a headphone jack with audio out, and RF headers for TI wireless eval modules. The EZ430 Kronos kit features the CC430 F6137 device, which has an LCDB module. The display is in a watch form factor, so it's a 96 segment display displaying the time and some other numerical sy symbols and other symbols. It again is a 4MUX display. This watch development tool is not only wearable because it's in a watch form factor, it also includes an accelerometer, integrated wireless, and comes with its own programming interface. Finally, there is the EVM430 F6736. This is a metering EVM. It features the F6736 device, which has an LCDC module and an LCD display of 160 segments, including 14 segment characters that can do alphanumeric characters, as well as other symbols. This is a single phase metering EVM that takes a number of different metering measurements. You can find this tool at TI.com and you can also find it under TI Designs where you'll find another, a number of other documents and support for it. Thank you for your time. And please, if you need have any questions, please check the TI website where we have a number of different reference designs on TI designs and application notes concerning LCDs. And also you can find help on the Texas Instruments Engineer to Engineer E2E forums at e2e.ti.com. Thanks.